Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Nights Podcast. While the wolves of Winterfell await a host of crowned stags and golden lions traveling up the King's Road on the other side of the world, the last embers of the dragon's dynasty burn in the free cities of Pentos. Viserys Targaryen and Daenerys Targaryen had been living in a manse in Pentos with the rich and powerful Illyrio Mopatis for about six months, and Daenerys is about to get tangled in both Illyrio and Viserys' webs of dreams. The chapter opens up with Viserys bringing his sister a dress made of fabric so fine it feels like water. She has a very important party to attend, and if they wrote the history of Viserys' reign, they would say it's started today. In the prologue, chapter 1 and chapter 2, there was no mention of the Dragon Lords, but we first meet them from the point of view of Daenerys Targaryen. All right, so guys, before we recorded this episode, we did a poll on my channel and thousands of people voted. And we were asking you guys if you wanted us to start including spoilers in this Obsidian Knights po podcast. So we wanted to know if you guys wanted spoilers for uh, future things, if we could reference things in the future so that we could theorize about things that happen later on in the books. And it was a very one-sided poll. 85% uh, saying that you guys wanted spoilers, only 15% saying that you didn't want spoilers. So from this point on, spoilers are gonna be on for Obsidian Knights. We'll make sure to mark it and say we're about to say some spoilers right before we do it every time. But yeah, spoilers are on. So we're gonna we're gonna spoil this whole thing. So be warned. Yeah, so we'll be using all of the published books spoilers. So Fire and Blood, World of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, Clash of Kings, Storm of Swords, Duncan Egg, everything. Nothing is off limits, but we will give a warning just in case you don't want to be spoiled. And also this is, I would say, day one of the defense of Daenerys Targaryen. I mean, yeah, sure. We've had, we've seen the character kind of uh, assassinated in kind of multiple ways in the show, both literally <laughs> and figuratively. But what's curious about this opening, Daenerys' one chapter, is we get a snapshot of who she is at this point in time in this book I mean you can make an argument about how she does or does not change over the course of you know the five books that are out right now but at this point in time we see who she is and we see what she desires and I had to point out that like from the beginning in this chapter we see that what she wants what she desires is not to be queen to not conquer but to go home to the place that she feels like is home, which is the house with the red door. Conquering and being king, ruling, is Viserys' dream. Now, you could argue, I guess, from this point on, that maybe Daenerys didn't have that dream because she didn't believe that she could accomplish that because Viserys put her down so much. But keep in mind, the house with the red door comes up over and over and over again in A Song of Ice and Fire. During the midst of her conquering, ruling, whatever she's doing, punishing those that she feels like needs to be punished, she always thinks back to the one place where she always felt like home, the house with the red door. So Jess, just, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, so there's no better place to start with defending Daenerys than Daenerys 1. We're gonna get right into it. We're not gonna hold you at all. We're gonna get right into it. And we're going to like just talk about how Daenerys ends up in Pentos in the first place. 
Daenerys is born on Dragonstone during a storm nine months after the sack of King's Landing and the ultimate fall of House Targaryen. Daenerys' mother, Rhaella Targaryen, died giving birth to her, and the garrison of Dragonstone intended to sell Viserys and Daenerys to the Usurper, which is the new king, Robert Baratheon. However, some people are still loyal to House Targaryen, and Daenerys and her brother are taken away across the Narrow Sea by Sir Willem Derry. She remembered Sir Willem dimly, a great gray bear of a man, half blind, roaring and bellowing orders from his sick bed. The servants had lived in terror of him, but he had always been kind to Danny. He called her Little Princess and sometimes My Lady, and his hands were soft as old leather. He never left his bed, though, and the smell of sickness clung to him day and night, a hot, moist, sickly sweet odor. That was when, th that was when they lived in Bravos, in the big house with the red door. Danny had her own room there with a lemon tree outside her window. After Sir Willem had died, the servants had stolen what little money they had left, and soon after they had been put out of the big house. Danny had cried when the red door closed behind them forever. Sir Willem Derry took Viserys and Daenerys to Bravos, and they lived in a house with a red door. That's what Daenerys remembers. But there are some discrepancies, I would say, about where the house with the red door is located. There's a lot we can talk about with, about the house with the red door, what it means to the story and who Daenerys is, where it is, and all of the conspiracy surrounding it. There's been a lot of discussion over the years about D Danny's past and how accurately is she remembering her past. I have to say that Preston Jacobs did some videos about this several years ago that were really huge. Um, but yeah, it's essentially like she's talking about like she's remembering grass beneath her feet and she's remembering a lemon tree outside of her window. And those aren't things that you would typically see in a city like Bravos. Bravos is a, a port city. Uh, it's very high north. It's cold and wet there. And that's not a place where citrus grows. There's even in, I think, an Aria chapter, there's someone making a joke about like getting lemons or oranges or something saying where do you think this is dorn um because that's where that's where citrus fruits grow like lemons and oranges and all that stuff and even in the dornish chapters later on it actually keeps referencing this the citrus tree that a character has that keeps dropping fruits on the ground but yeah essentially is daenerys remembering correctly because um she only she's been she's had Viserys with her her whole life and he's been telling her all this different stuff so is she was she truly in Bravos or is that what she was told told and that comes into play and it becomes important because of other ideas about other people's origin stories that come into that have discrepancies and m might get a little shaky and wonky if Danny wasn't in Bravos and she was in the place where Citros normally grows which is Dorn, then that says a lot about the character Jon Snow that's about to come up. Um, if he was born in Dorn, like, I mean, there's a lot of theories about, we, we're not going to say what is concrete and what, is it, what isn't yet, but there's a lot of theories that he might have been born in Dorn if they were born in the same place that has some weird implications, perhaps. So that's what's going like on. Like that they're twins? <laughs> perhaps. You know, that's, what it, that's the thick type of thing that that could, you know, suggest. So that's why we have to, like, but we have to tread carefully because books aren't done and there's not it's not closed yet yeah it's not and i don't think I, I think there's a lot that could change from what we think is canon yeah and i do remember in a dance with dragons quentin martell who was a son of doran martell a son, he's a son of doran like basically a prince of doran he goes to daenerys and he has this contract that was made in secret in Bravos. It was made. It was signed by the Sea Lord of Bravos, and it was basically for Viserys to marry Arianne Martell, his sister. And wasn't that that was done by Oberyn, right? And Sir Willem Derry. I think yes. I I definitely think the house with the red door was in Bravos, but Bravos is described in length. I think Bravos is the most like fully dis like fully fledged described place in the books the, the it's, it's like fleshed out so much and 
there is no way that there should be a lemon tree in Bravos. Or a huge field of grass. I mean, it's like, how would you... That, that's one thing. If it was an indoor lemon tree that they were somehow sustaining some way, but she specifically remembers a lemon tree outside of her window, yeah. which doesn't make sense for Bravos. Um, and it doesn't. <laughs> so getting getting back to this initial chapter, now that we've talked about that, because we could go down like a crazy rabbit hole with the Bravos lemon tree situation. So we talked about in the last chapter how George R. R. Martin is crafting this really hard world. He's like, Rick and grow up, even though you're three. Um, look at how hard Danny's life is already. And think about the fact that she's also called, called a princess. Like, what other princess has this life? So she is essentially a slave. She's her brother's slave. Um, and she's getting ready to be sold to... Um, sold like cattle, like a, to another slave master, essentially. Um, and yeah, her, her, Viserys, her brother, is extremely abusive to Daenerys. She, and it's a testament to actually how strong-willed she is and how strong of a mind that she actually has that she didn't kind of snap under his abuse. Um, and then we talk about defending Daenerys. I don't even know if I want to use the word defending so much as, like, I just want to present her as she really is in the book. And, like I said, at this point, she's innocent. Um, but Viserys, look at the traits that he has. Totally delusions of grandeur. Um, delusions of grandeur. Um, totally narcissistic. He's probably a psychopath. And he de in one, and one thing, one nasty trait about him, too, is he doesn't respect other cultures. It'll, it'll come to bite him in the ass. <laughs> um, but, yeah, he has these very... Uh, horrible, awful, evil, kind of, I don't want to say the word evil, but just malignant traits, right? There's this idea um, that's getting thrown around the internet now that Targaryens just snap. That they have a point where they just snap and they go crazy and they kill all their friends. But what I'm saying is that that is not canon. When a Targaryen is quote unquote mad, it's a combination of several different behaviors, right? Uh, whether it's delusion, whether they're like um, kind of crazy and they're seeing stuff or hearing stuff. It's a combination of all this stuff, uh, whether they're like crazy, sadistic. Um, and it's a pattern of behavior that lasts for years, that's been going on and on and on and on consistently. Viserys has been like this. The Mad King had been like that. Um, Magar the Cruel had been like that. Um, when, when Aegon V went mad and did the stuff at Summerhall, that had been a pattern for 13 years he had been going down that path. So, yeah, so when a Targaryen is mad, it's established. It's not something that happens at the blink of an eye, like in the show. That's what I'm referencing, in case you didn't get that. To me, it's clear that when they, when they dance around all the Targaryen madness and, and things, when George dances around it, everything is like like you were saying Magor he like killed a horse or something like at 3 years old Joffrey cut open a cat yeah like they're they're doing things um i think he killed a stable i think Magor later killed like a stable boy or slashed the stable boy in the face Viserys i want to say it was Sir Barristan said that even as a child Viserys was basically a piece of work and he never left the mad king's side and the mad king didn't didn't become the mad king overnight but there were traits like you said that were always there he was very vain he had like these grand plans like oh i'm gonna make build a waterfall in dorn and i'm gonna do this i'm gonna build a, a make a city out of white marble like he had just i would say thoughts that weren't grounded where you could see that he was deter deteriorating over time but it took a long long time with Daenerys in the show we're supposed to believe that she just snapped overnight yeah I mean, another thing about her father uh Ares since we're talking about Ares who who hasn't actually been brought up I don't think just yet um but we don't really know much about him if he has but Ares was the previous king before Robert Baratheon, who was stabbed in the back by Jaime Lannister, who will soon meet in the book. But Ares Targaryen was sadistic. He 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 lived for sadism. Daenerys, 
doesn't have a sadistic bone in her body. She does not like to see people be hurt. I mean, she really doesn't. Even when they wrong her, she's kind of like, am I really doing the right thing here? She's always questioning as the books go on. She's always taking a step back and questioning what she's doing and questioning, like, am I like my father? Am I going too far? Yeah. Then she brought up Aries. We can go to what Daenerys has been told her whole life. Everything that was taken from them. Our land, he called it. The words were like a prayer with him. If he said them enough, the gods were sure to hear. Ours by blood right, taken from us by treachery. But ours, ours still, ours forever. You do not steal from the dragon, oh no. The dragon remembers. And perhaps the dragon did remember, but Danny could not. She had never seen this land her brother said was theirs, this realm beyond the narrow sea. These places he talked of, Casterly Rock and the Eyrie, High Garden and the Vale of Erin, Dorne and the Isle of Faces, they were just words to her. Viserys had been a boy of eight when they fled King's Landing to escape the advancing armies of the Usurper, but Daenerys had been only a quickening in her mother's womb. Yet sometimes Danny would picture the way it had been, so often had her brother told her the stories. The midnight flight to Dragonstone, moonlight shimmering on the ship's black sails, her brother Rhaegar battling the usurper in the bloody waters of the trident and dying for the woman he loved, the sack of King's Landing by the ones the series called the usurper's dogs, the lords Lannister and Stark, Princess Ely of Dorne pleading for mercy as Rhaegar's heir was ripped from her breast and murdered before her eyes, the polished skulls of the last dragon stared down sightlessly, from the walls of the throne room while the Kingslayer opened father's throat with a golden sword. Imagine you being a child. At this time, Daenerys is 13. And for the last 13 years, this is what she's been told about her family. This is this is what's been drilled into her. That this, our land, it's our land. They took it from us. They killed our family. They killed our brother. They killed our father. They they killed our brother's children. That that's like it's kind of hard to grow up on just hearing that. I mean, it's all essentially true. Yeah. For the most part, but it's it's a very one sided um, interpretation of the story. Um, yeah, Viserys is definitely painting a one sided picture. I um, mean, and, and it's curious because this is all Daenerys knows of this. Like she said, these are just words to me. These are just names and these are characters. Some of them we've met and some of them we will meet. And it's curious that we are presented with a picture of Robert Baratheon from Dan from Danny's perspective before we actually do get to see him. Because from Danny's perspective, Robert Baratheon is essentially the quote unquote boogeyman, like a shadow, like a ghost. Yes. That's like always hunting. Like Robert could be around any corner hunting us down. He wants to kill us at any turn. And she talks about the Starks. Like the, the usurpers' dogs. We've already met the Starks. They seem they seem like kind of cool people, right? But from her perspective, they brought down her family. They are the reason that sh that, th that she's the beggar queen and Viserys is the beggar king. I mean, they are the reason that her life is kind of like this, essentially. I mean, this is why we don't have a castle. This is why we had to sell our mother's crown. Um, this is why I'm so mean to you. It's because of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, basically. Is, is, is what Viserys keeps saying. Um, but I, I think Viserys is just as those negative traits and they would have came out regardless. Um, I, if Viserys had been the prince in, in, in uh, King's Landing, he would have been just as bad as Joffrey, who we'll meet also. Yes. Um, I, one thing I think is interesting specifically about that quote and what she remembers or what Viserys has told her or what Sir Willem Derry has told her over the years is they say that... Um, Rhaegar was battling the usurper on the trident and dying for the woman that he loved. Mm -hmm. But then it says Princess Ilya of Dorne was pleading for mercy as Rhaegar's heir was ripped from her breast. So it kind of makes you think that the woman he loved and Princess Ilya of Dorne aren't the same. Because he doesn't say dying for Princess Il Ilya. It doesn't say that. It says dying for the woman that he loved. And then it references Princess Ilya later by her name. So it kind of, maybe you want to put a pin in that 
and see if that has any importance later in the story. Yeah, sure. And it's really easy to just read that and think that he's referencing Princess Elia of Dorne because it's written kind of vaguely. Yeah. Intentionally. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> was she the woman that he loved? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's... Mm-hmm. It's meant to make you associate that with, that line with her, yeah. Because it says she's carrying Rhaegar's heir, mm-hmm. but it's written in a way that is is ambiguous enough so that it could be somebody else. Yes, but with but with Daenerys, this is what she's being told every day by her brother. He says it so much that he that to her it's Viserys's prayer. <laughs> This is madness right here. The words were like a prayer with him. If he said them enough, the gods were sure to hear. That's probably what Viserys actually thinks because he's insane. But he's very abusive to Daenerys. And I think we should talk about that. So I'm not defending Viserys. But Viserys was very young when all of this happened as well. He's been essentially taking care of his sister, a baby, since he was like like eight or something. Um, and looking out for her. So I'm, I'm sure that it's, it, it's done damage to him, but he's taken a lot of it out on Daenerys. Um, and he's very aggressive towards her. He calls it waking the dragon. I know how pretentious when he like attacks her or beats her or whatever. And there also clearly is this sexual tension. So Daenerys is 13 in this chapter. And so Viserys is like 19 or 20 at the start of the book. And um, it's clear that there is some sexual tension, very one-sided sexual tension, that gets brought out as aggression on Viserys' part. He's doing stuff like pin- pinching her nipples, and he's always uh, commenting on her appearance and her look, and saying she's too skinny when he's clearly attracted to his sister. And the thing is, Daenerys always expected that she would end up with Viserys, because as it's brought up in this chapter, that's what the Targaryens have done for since the time of Aegon, and it was to keep the bloodlines pure. She had always assumed that she would wed Viserys when she came of age. For centuries, the Targaryens had married brother to sister, since Aegon the Conqueror had taken his sisters to bride. The line must be kept pure, Viserys had told her a thousand times. Theirs was the king's blood, the golden blood of old Valyria, the blood of the dragon. Dragons did not mate with the beasts of the field, and Targaryens did not mingle their blood with that of lesser men. Yet now, Viserys schemed to sell her to a stranger, a barbarian. This is the Targaryen sentiment, and this is how it was since the time that they took control of Westeros. This is why they were allowed to do things that, allowed to get away with stuff that, yeah, I guess, average people didn't, because they were kind of like these fantastical people from a different land. So they've got silver hair and purple eyes, and they've got dragons, and they've got this strange way of shaping stone that we'll get into later. And they've got all this, they can do all this weird stuff that other people, I mean, they're kind of above people, um, essentially. They were kind of closer to the divine than uh, men. But it was curious as the ages went on and the dragons slowly died, because at this point in history, there are no more dragons, supposedly. Um people came to see the Targaryens as more just normal men, just more people. And by the time of Robert's rebellion, the Targaryen kind of respect, that sense that they were above the average men, had kind of waned in the eyes of, I guess, the other nobles. Um, maybe it still existed somewhat, somewhat in the eyes of the peasants, but in the eyes of the nobles, they just saw them as other nobles. So when Robert rebelled, it, a lot of people that had grievances with the Targaryens at that time were like, yeah, this is the time we can take these mofos down. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like it got checked. You, you, you're you not gods. You are just people. I mean, you might have you might have some elements that are fantastical to you, but you're not gods. But there still, at the same time, could be some truth to them being quote-unquote special because he, we talk about the bloodlines needing to be kept pure. And you have to think, um, why is that so? So if there was some magical element in their blood that needed to be maintained, then it would make sense why they didn't want to dilute their blood with like any outside sources. But at this point in history, when Viserys is desperate for an army, it's like, okay, I'm going to sell you to a savage because it's like, what what do they have to lose? Literally nothing. Nothing. And fire and blood, I just want to talk about fire and blood really quick. 
because it is like everything you're talking about I'm like yes 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 because in fire and blood I realized how the intermarriage the the uh, incestual marriage between the Targaryens has been something that kind of hindered them a lot yeah. with with the high septons like Aegon it was accepted that he would marry his sister wives and then they had pre- like a septons and priests that would go around the country and say why it's okay for them to do it because they are gods and like other people would come and want to have multiple wives or marry their cousin or whatever or sister and they would be like can you ride a dragon like riding a dragon was what made them gods per se but also when sep when septons changed there got different people came in that didn't agree with the incestual marriage that called it abomination i think all of Aenys, all of Aenys's children were abominations where they they were declared abominations and unfit to rule so it was a hindrance in my opinion politically when trying to rule westeros and i think the beef between the targaryens and the um starry sept or this the faith of the seven it reminds me of the english throne beefing with the roman catholic church well that's totally the structure i mean that's totally the struggle that george R. martin is uh, emulating yeah. here yeah it's it's the same kind of conflict um i forget which one king louis the 14th uh was doing all this stuff that the, that the um it's, he's French, but like he was doing all this stuff that the, that the Roman Church wasn't okay with, and they. This is, so the, this is a very this is that was a very common thing in history. Yeah. Because uh, the church is such a powerful force because it's belief, and it's about the afterlife. You're playing with like people's you know sense of you know a higher power or or something. That that's why you're playing with people's immortal souls. Yeah. <laughs> And and when people see something, when when the king is committing abomination, it's a huge problem. You know that becomes a huge problem for Cersei, and and the Lannisters later on as well. The same type of thing because um, of the church getting stirred up. Um, but but yeah, it's 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 a historical struggle. It's a struggle that's happened in history time and time again, and it's it's curious to see it playing out in the books with the Targaryen history. Definitely and. I, I like that's why I really like Fire and Blood. I really like reading Fire and Blood, but so I, I think it's gonna have implications in the story as we go further, like into the Winds of Winter. This this bl- uh, dragon mating, dragon incestual thing may have a part to play later on, since it's talked about in the very first chapter and then talked about in the histories that go along with the books and in Duncan Egg and, and like in everywhere it's talked about. But um, I wanna get back to Viserys because the reason we got into this incestuous debate is because Viserys and Daenerys were supposed to wed. And we actually later learn, and spoiler here, in A Dance with Dragons, that Illyrio had to put a, a guard outside of Daenerys's door her bedroom door because Viserys was going to sneak in there and take her virginity the night before she married Drogon I mean Drogo <laughs> then speaking of Valyrio it's curious how the young princess Daenerys is immediately suspicious of Valyrio yes queen she knows that he's yes. up to something um but Viserys is not because he is delusional and a narcissist and kind of an idiot and it's He's allowing himself to be manipulated by Illyrio when Daenerys can see that he's not doing this for no reason. What is the price here? And it even says in this chapter that even at 13, she knew that this didn't come for free. So, like, what is what is your long game? Yeah. Um, and Daenerys can see it, but Viserys can't because she's much more perceptive than he is. And then we also see that at the party, at the manse, that she is kind of, like, picking out everybody and seeing who they all are she notices a knight um and she's she's just a very perceptive young girl yeah she's very observant she asks herself you know why is Illyrio helping us and like you're saying Viserys is eating up everything 
Illyrio is saying. And Illyrio literally is playing Viserys like a fiddle. Like when, when Viserys talks about the guards, they're, they're being guards at the um, party. Illyrio's like, yes, because so many people want to kill you. <laughs> And Viserys is like, yes, Illyrio, yes, you have no idea. Like, no one's trying to really kill you right now. Al- no like, one cares. Like, Illyrio, Illyrio is just, like, I don't know, what would it blow and smoke in your ass? Like, yeah. he does, like, and he falls and for Daenerys it. Daenerys is just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, <laughs> sure. Daenerys They're trying to like, kill my um, brother, sure. Yeah, uh, okay, like, I'm here, whatever. But with Daenerys, I think it's interesting that she does question Illyrio's motives in the very first chapter. And not in the very first chapter, but in that paragraph. And then throughout the entirety of the chapter. And she knows that there is, like, for a certain price, Illyrio will sell anyone to anybody. And it's... That's been said about him. That doesn't become said about somebody... For no reason. Yeah, he'll sell even his friends. Oh, what? What am I? Right. I'm not even a friend. I'm just some. I'm just some princess that's in his house. It's like what? What do you think he's gonna do to you? Yeah. If he'll sell even his friends, and it makes you think about somebody else in the future, doesn't it, Gray? Yes. If he'll sell his friends, doesn't that bring another person to mind? Yes, it does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll get there. <laughs> it does. We'll get yeah, there. Yeah, we will. We don't need to get that far yet, but yeah. That's that's a curious line. He'll sell even his friends. Hmm. I'd love to but, see it. Actually, I'd love to see him sell that friend, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also in this chapter, we, we see Jorah for the first time. Yes. Jorah the Andal. Daenerys notices that he's a knight. We'll get to know that character a little bit more. Um, I will say that if you like the show version of, of Jorah... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, but like the book version is like... A fucking perv. I I don't I don't want to like get into. It. He hasn't done it yet, so we'll get there when we get there. But it's like I don't really like the character. I'm just gonna be straight up. I don't like the book version of Jorah that much, and I'm not gonna like lie and be like, oh, I like him. I mean, like Ian did a, such a great job portraying that character in the show, but like he made a much nicer, much more palatable Jorah than the book one. Say that. I just say that. <laughs> he. It's, mm, he's a slaver. Mm. He's a slaver. We don't like slavers. There's a lot in the Daenerys chapters about slavery. That's kind of a theme. Yes. That it, it's not kind of. It just is a theme. So let's talk about the collars. Yes. Right. Yes, the collars. Let's talk about it. Earlier in the chapter, Daenerys is is, is talking about how she's they've her handmaidens and stuff have said to her not the handmaidens but the slaves have said to her stuff like even Drogo, Cal Drogo's slaves have golden collars. And then she sees that she's, when later she's wearing a gold thing on her neck, and it looks like a collar. Yeah. It, I would say so it's, it's like, like a choker with like Valyrian glyphs on it. Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful, but it's like, it's a golden collar. It's the same thing. I am just as much of a slave as any of these other slaves. She's so fucking observant. <laughs> she's, she's so observant. Like, and, and that's true. That's true. She doesn't yeah. have a choice. And what's, no what's happening to her. She can't say, uh, I, she can say, I don't want to marry this guy. And she does say it, but that doesn't matter. Look what it gets her. It gets her, oh, you're going to do it. And there's nothing that you can do to stop me. Like, he's in Viserys is like, the, he, she's so callous in the way he says it to his own little sister. Like, you see his brutality. Yeah. Just like bubbling below the surface in this chapter throughout it. You don't see the full extent of it just here, but you see the brutality. I don't want to be his queen, she heard herself say in a small, thin voice. Please, please, Viserys, I don't want to. I want to go home. Home. He kept his voice low, but she could hear the fury in his tone. How are we to go home, sweet sister? They took our home from us. He drew her into the shadows, out of sight, his fingers digging into her skin. How are we to go home, he repeated, meaning King's Landing and Dragonstone, and all the realm they had lost. Danny had only meant their rooms in Illyrio's estate. No true home, surely, though all they had, but her brother did not want to hear that. There was no home there for him. Even the big house with the red door had not been home for him. 
His fingers dug hard into her arm, demanding an answer. I don't know, she said at last, her voice breaking, tears welled in her eyes. I do, he said sharply. We go home with an army, sweet sister, with Call Drogo's army. That is how we go home. And if you must wed him and bed him for that, you will, he smiled at her. I let his whole calisar fuck you, if need be, sweet sister. All 40,000 men and their horses too, if that was what it took to get my army. Be grateful it is only Drogo. In time, you may even learn to like him. Now dry your eyes. Illyria was bringing him over, and he will not see you crying. Fucking so, asshole. Yeah, that paints a picture of who Viserys is. Yeah, he's very um, abusive. Like Mentally and physically. We we also see Khal Drogo in this chapter. Our first appearance of Khal Drogo. Bay. <laughs> <laughs> and Daenerys immediately notices that he's not kind of as mean and rough looking as she thought he was. He's tall. He's no more than 30 years old. He's not super old. Um, and also Viserys seems super interested in, <laughs> into him. He calls him, um, he's like, oh, that's, that's Aegon reborn. Like, that's the, that's the greatest cow that's ever lived. Like, Viserys is super into, yeah, <laughs> into Drogo. she is. So that's cool. <laughs> Another thing that I think is kind of interesting when we're talking about, um, Khal Drogo and the Dothraki is that they are, they do have a different culture. They do. They do have a different culture. But actually, Khal Drogo has a manse in Pentos, and it's huge. It has nine towers and shit. Um, yeah. And it was given to them by what would it be, the ma- the magisters. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because they just give them stuff like like don't sack the city. Yeah. So we kind of learn that. See, we learn we learn two things in this one quote, and one is that Illyrio is a lying mf'er. He tells Daenerys and Viserys that they give the Horse Lord these things. They the Lord of Light would hold their city against a million Dothraki, um, but their friendship comes so cheap, so they just give them these things. They don't give them these things just because their friendship is cheap. They give them these things because if the Dothraki did want to take Pentos, I think that they could. And I think that they know that. Yeah, and Khal Drogo is an interesting one. And we don't get a point of view chapter from him, but there's a lot of of little things about Khal Drogo that are interesting. So he's the biggest Khal in the East, or one of the biggest ones. He's extraordinarily wealthy um so i wonder if that's the reason he he went for such an exotic queen uh or if there were some other reason like a prophecy there's been hints that maybe cal drogo was trying to make some kind of prophecy happen i and i've seen this theory tossed around the internet it's not my original thing i've seen a lot of people talking about this but there's hints that maybe cal drogo had already maybe been been um to vase um, Vase Dothrak and gotten the prophecy of the stallion that mounts the world and he maybe for some reason thought he needed a Valyrian princess specifically I don't know I don't know but may, there's there's little hints that crop out as the book goes on as this book goes on that maybe that could have been the case I'm not saying anything definitive just yet but I'm saying if there was a cow that wanted to do something like that it would be Khal Drogo, one that is so powerful and has so many connections and likes like the finer things. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would like to think that that's why he chose Daenerys, mm-hmm. because it it, it is kind of you know odd that he picked a Valyrian princess. Yeah, I mean, think about it. No other call has a Valyrian princess or any other no kind of princess. <laughs> but he is really rich, though, so it's like I could get a get a princess. So maybe it also could have just been like a statement, like "Look how rich I am that I got I got a Valyrian princess." Like what? This is the last Targaryen princess. Like so she, that is a prize for for sure. That's a prize that like a lot of people would probably want. Daughter to the old king, sister to the new. <laughs> exactly. I mean, sister to the new, <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> so it's like. And then she's, I mean, I don't want to sound creepy at the risk of sounding really creepy right now. I mean, she's ripe. She's 13, like right at that age. 
it's middle ages people get used to it <laughs> it's like it's like basically isn't it in this chapter it's like if she's if she's if she's bled she's ready for the cow yeah that's literally in this chapter yeah, it it's kind of kind of messed up because Viserys is like Viserys is like are you sure he likes his, <laughs> his women this young <laughs> Yeah, so if they've had their period, their moon blood, whatever, that means they can bear children. They're old enough. Moon blood, like the new the new show. Blood, blood. moon. <laughs> That's just a working title. Everyone, okay, yeah, whatever. I was like, working title. I don't know, man. Watchers on the Wall, on their article, they were like, we think it's real. So I don't know. Let me see. Really? Yeah. They think it's the official. You didn't see the article? No. Yeah, they think it's the official one. I don't. Because they had, like, they showed, like, they got a picture of, like, the script. I think it's going to be, that? yeah, did yeah, thing? I did see that, yeah. like, the logo. But I I think it's going to be, like, something, like, after, thr- before Thrones or something like that. Well, like, I, I think, like, like, George was saying it's going to have something to do with Throne because it's. Yeah, you got to keep the name. I mean, yeah, they'll, they'll probably just do it like they do with Hunger Games, Game of Thrones Saga, Blood Moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do like a, it'll be a subtitle. I feel like they'll probably do something like that. I just can't, like, I can't. I can't keep thinking that if it, if it's Blood Moon, that it's gonna be like Great Empire of the Dawn. Like how else? I would like that. Huh? I mean, I would love some Great Empire of the Dawn, but like looking at all these white people they've got, <laughs> I don't know how. Well, so I was um, talking to someone. Not gonna name drop on them, but I um, was talking to someone, and they said that Melissa Blackwood, not Melissa Blackwood. A lady Blackwood can't be Melissa. Melissa's not old enough. Or Melissa. That's the blonde chick, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, the blonde. Mm-hmm. She's supposed to be a Blackwood. Okay. Yeah. So. And she's the main character. So how could it be Empire of the Dawn if it's like? Yeah, but I think it's like intercontinental, or was it? Would that be called intercontinental, like Game of Thrones? Yeah, it would. Where there's it things would. going on in the east, and there's things going on in the west. So there's going to be a character somewhere in the east that I guess is like a. Great, this is going to be terrible. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Give it a chance. I am, but I could just see the terribleness of it. <laughs> Because Game of Thrones has already set the standard for what, like, the effort that you have to put into it to be successful. So it's going to be like, oh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> well, let's, let's see if I just Daenerys. Right, Daenerys. So anyway, so I think we can kind of begin to wrap up Daenerys, right? So it's funny going back and reading all these chapters again and just really sitting down and reading them in order. Because, like, as uh, people that make videos about A Song of Ice and Fire, we're not necessarily reading it in order a lot of times. But now, like, actually doing it, it's crazy how short a lot of these chapters feel. So this, and, and there's so much information being get, get pushed across in these little seemingly short chapters. Like, we learn so much about the Targaryen history and their dynasty and what series and Daenerys have went through to get to this point. And we meet all these other characters. We learn about all this stuff in the East. The Lord of Light is mentioned. Um, uh, the Dothraki. All, all these different um, places. Yeah. And, and the free cities. Um, there's so much that's named here. Like, And she goes in and she sees all these different people. And George R. R. Martin is just a master. A master at just building a world. And then also just hinting at a wider, richer world. And then just like the sense of the characters that we just get immediately i feel like i know illyrio from reading this chapter yeah i feel like i'm I, when they were sitting inside of the palican with him and she could smell his flesh and she could hear him talking i feel like i could just hear him <laughs> i was in there with him hear Viserys, him <laughs> i feel like i feel like i'm sitting beside him i feel like i know the dude and then daenerys i just have this picture of like this innocent just quiet just sad young girl but with like a lot of brains and her had a lot of thoughts in her mind but just like reserved and sad and just kind of so i want to make a i want to um have a, a reference i want to make an analogy right go for it in harry potter right which is one of my favorite series growing up as a kid uh, we learn about voldemort's mother later in the series so voldemort's mother thought that she was had no powers her entire life because she was so abused by her brother and her father but when they were gone her power awakened and that's how I feel about Daenerys. Once she, once she got a taste of who she really was, and once she was set free and she realized who she was, her power awakened. Daughter and of death. 
Daughter of Daughter Death. Daughter of Death, <laughs> Mother of Dragons, and it's such a brilliant, it's so brilliant to see her. Oh, yeah, that's such and, a good analogy because yeah. because I've always thought that um, Daughter of Death was said to her because she is born into who she is because these From people death. die. Because You're these, brilliant. These people die. You're brilliant. It, totally. I, I totally, that's such a brilliant analogy. I mean, I mean, that's such a brilliant way of putting it. I, I totally agree. I really like that. I think we should end the podcast with this quote because this quote separates how different Daenerys and Viserys really are. And it tells us what Daenerys really wants. And I think this quote kind of sums up this whole chapter. We will have it all back someday, sweet sister, he would promise her. Sometimes his hands shook when he talked about it. The jewels and the silks, Dragonstone and King's Landing, the Iron Throne and the Seven Kingdoms, all they have taken from us, we will have it back. Viserys lived for that day. All that Daenerys wanted back was the big house with the red door, the lemon tree outside her window, the childhood she had never known. That is this chapter, wrapped up in one quote. Viserys wants Westeros. He wants to use Daenerys as a pawn. She's a child. She's literally 13 years old, and he wants to use her to further his ambitions to get the throne, the Seven Kingdoms, and King's Landing, and Dragonstone, and all of that back. But Daenerys doesn't want that. If Daenerys could decide right now, she would go find the house with the red door and the lemon tree outside her window and be a child because she is a child. And I think that's something that we should remember going forward. And because she's gonna grow. You're gonna see massive growth throughout Daenerys' chapters. And I think she's probably the most changed character from the beginning to the to 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 Dance of Dragons, but her core Break. her core values <laughs> always stay the same. And you can always see that girl from this chapter in Daenerys as we go forward. For sure. So this has been episode four of Obsidian Nights. Thank you guys so much for listening. Yes, thank you for listening. Check us out on Twitter. And also you can catch the previous episodes on the playlist linked above and below. And be looking forward to us coming out on iTunes and other podcast places. Coming soon.